So in the previous two lectures, we studied some model physical systems uh, where uh, the concept of quantum field arises more or less naturally. Now, the main interest of our course will be uh, field theories that describe so fundamental interactions between elementary particles. And so they should uh, be consistent with basic principles of physics that we know, in particular with relativistic invariance. So we will study uh, relativistic field theories. And the first type of uh, relativistic fields that we'll study is the klein gordon field. So, um, since these field, fields are relativistic, they, the natural habitat for them will be the Minkowski space. Uh, with the four coordinates as usual. So, we unify spatial coordinates in time in one four vector, x mu. And uh, our fields will be functions of, uh, of x mu. Uh, so <coughs> fields will be functions of uh, x mu. And, well, they themselves should uh, transform nicely under Lorentz transformations. And the objects that uh, do so are tensors in general. So these fields will be uh, tensors um, uh, with some, some number of indices. So the fields should transform um, covariantly under Lorentz transformations. So the simplest example is uh, the field that doesn't transform at all, so the scalar. And the Klingorn field is, is the scalar field. So we'll, first, we will study uh, fields that is uh, do not transform under Lorentz transformations. So I remind you that um, uh, uh, important notion in relativity is uh, the interval between two events. So here I. I will always uh, sum over repeated indices. This is the usual Einstein convention. Uh, and uh, the metric tensor is uh, uh, diagonal. And we will take it in the signature where the spatial coordinates has, have uh, negative signs. I don't know what was the convention in the relativity course. Perhaps it was opposite. That's. Uh, it's always the case. So people doing relativity always use the minus plus 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 convention. And in the field theory, they use plus minus minus minus. Just the fact of history. So uh, we will stick to this convention. So this means that the interval between two events that happened in the same point uh, coincides with the time interval. Then uh, on the light cone, it is 0, and is negative for uh, space-like separated events. OK, so uh, then uh, uh, tensors and uh, vectors have um, a certain number of uh, Lorentz indices. And we will use this metric to contract the indices. So for instance, if we have two. Uh, the four vectors v and u, v scalar product with u is defined as g mu nu, v mu u nu, and this is the same as v mu u mu. So we'll use all these uh, standard conventions of special relativity. 
Uh, all right. Uh, so, um, another remark is about units. Um, so, we will be interested in the regime where both uh, relativistic effects are important and quantum mechanics is, is, uh, will, be, uh, um, will be also important. So, uh, both C and H bar will be, in a sense, finite. So, uh, you can think of non-relativistic approximation as an expansion in 1 over C. The same as qu quantum theory, you can think of semi-classical expansion as an expansion in H bar. So, it's therefore useful to keep them as parameters. But in our case, uh, the velocities will be comparable to the speed of light, or equal to the speed of light. Uh, and um, quantum mechanics will be important. So we can choose units such that the speed of light is equal to 1 and the h bar is equal to 1. So this simply means that we uh, say uh, define velocities as, so if we say that velocity is equal to 1 half, then it is means that uh, the velocity is just uh, 0 0.5 times c. Okay, so uh, we measure velocities in units of uh, the speed of light. So velocity becomes dimensionless. Therefore, the units of uh, time and the units of distance are the same. Uh, the units of energy is the same as the units of mass, are the same as units of mass, uh, because of E equals mc squared relationship. So this is also the same as units of momentum. Uh, and also, um, now what happens when we put h bar to 1, well, h bar is the right-hand side of the uh, principle. So P times X now is dimensionless. So uh, distances and therefore time intervals have uh, are measured in units inverse to those of momentum and to those of mass and energies. So there is just one unit, one basic unit, uh, which we choose to be the unit of um, of energy, uh, so we will stick to energy units, and as a basic unit, we will use uh, electron volt. <coughs> so this is. Uh, the common unit, it, came, it comes from particle physics, and it's the energy that uh, an electron would uh, acquire by passing a potential difference of one volt, by definition. So what, well, to give you an idea of what it, uh, um, of how much, uh, it is in other units uh, than, uh, say, in temperature units, electron volt is roughly 10 to the 4 uh, Kelvin uh, divided by Boltzmann constant. Um, then we can express uh, masses of particles in electron volts. Uh, so, for instance, mass of the electron will be 5, uh, uh, 0 0.5110 uh, mega electron volts. Um, then proton mass is 2,000 times larger, so it's uh, uh, 938 uh, 938.3. MAV, and so on. So 
um, we can, in principle, express anything we want in electron volts, like uh, centimeters would be inverse electron volts. One can express one centimeter in, the, in this unit. So we will not write, we will not, instead of H bar and C, we will write always Y in all the formulas. Okay, so with these preliminaries, um, let me now continue to describe the theory of the Klein Gordon field. So the Klein Gordon field, what is, what is, what is it? It's, uh, it is a scalar function of uh, coordinates, um, so of space uh, coordinates and time. Uh, so this will be a Klein Gordon field. Scalar field. And we need to write down some equation that is satisfies. So like Maxwell equation for electric and magnetic fields. So uh, this should be a second order differential equation. And uh, actually there is not, there is no much choice. So the only equation that we can write is this one. And this is called uh, Klein Gordon equation. Um, so what is the rationale <coughs> behind? So first of all, um, this is the only uh, relativistically invariant equation uh, of the second order acting on the scalar field, with the scalar field, so uh, which is linear. Um, so really, uh, uh, if we start with the so the the operator that acting on the field uh, should be second order derivative. So the second order term, well, it contains two derivatives, and there is only one way to contract their indices, which is with the Gmu, right? So we get d squared. The linear term must be absent because one derivative has an index, and we have nothing, no other vector to contract it with. And well, we can add some constant m. So this is actually the only uh, Lorentz invariant uh, second order differential equation that we can write. So the second rationally comes from, um, well, uh, we can start from the four momentum of a massive particle. So you know that the four momentum includes energy as the time-like component and then the usual momentum as its space component. Uh, and for a relativistic particle uh, of mass m the energy should be equal to square root of uh, p squared plus m squared this is the famous einstein's uh, relationship so here written without the factors of c so it should be c to the 4 and c squared here uh, but we said c to 1 and then this can be written as an equation for the four vector uh, that the uh, scalar square of the uh, four vector or the momentum four vector should be equal to m squared. Uh, So and then, we, as usual in quantum mechanics, we replace uh, p mu by i times d mu 
where by dimly we denote the uh, derivatives with respect to x. Then we substitute this into the equation p squared minus m squared plus zero, and then we get the Kling Gordon operator. Okay. Uh, so p squared minus m squared then becomes minus p squared minus m squared. Uh, so this equation, in a sense, uh, is is a way to represent the dispersion relation for massive particles. For a massive particle, and so the physical meaning of the parameter m is just the mass. So it should uh, somehow describe a particles of mass m upon quantization. So this is what we could expect. Uh, so, well, um, uh, now um, the way to press. The way we will proceed here is a little bit different from what we have done on the previous two lectures. So there we started with some physical picture of, I don't know, atoms vibrating near their equilibrium positions, and then derived what, uh, what the Hamiltonian uh, looked like in the uh, convenient variables. So here uh, we will do sort of an opposite thing. So we start with this equation. Uh, which uh, has a priori no physical motivation. Uh, and then we will proceed through the... So we'll regard this as a dynamical system where phi is a dynamical variable, and then quantize it as, uh, as textbooks and quantum mechanics prescribe. So to quantize, we need to... Um, uh, write this equation in the Hamiltonian form. So we, we need to understand what are the canonical variables. Uh, and so this can be done by first uh, uh, deriving from the action. So um, indeed there is an action principle behind this equation. So one can uh, see that um, if you start with the action of this form, Uh, then Kling Gordon equation arises as the uh, arises from the condition that the variation of this action vanishes. Indeed, let's take delta S. This will be equal to d for x d mu delta phi d mu phi minus m squared delta phi. In the first term, we integrate by parts. <clears throat> and then we get here minus d squared acting on phi minus m squared phi. So you see that uh, delta s uh, equals to zero is equivalent to the Klein Gordon equation. So once we have um, the action, we can write down the Lagrangian. And from the Lagrangian, we can uh, derive the Hamiltonian and then proceed with quantization. Yes? Sorry. If I, if I can ask a dumb question, um, is, is phi here complex valued or real valued? This is real valued. We will also consider complex valued fields later. So here it is uh, a real variable. Yes. Um, so I was wondering how do we get this uh, Which uh, this one? Um, well, it's uh, again you can guess that it should be like that because this is the only Lorentz invariant expression that contains two derivatives uh, and the. Uh, scalar field that you can write. So if you 
require this to be Lorentz invariant, and this is the only possible expression that you can write, and then you can check that it leads to the, the Gordon equation. So, um, well, the action in classical mechanics, the action is written as an integral of the Lagrangian. So here you see that we have four-dimensional integral. So indeed, we can separate time integration. And then the Lagrangian will be whatever <coughs> uh, remains of that. Uh, where this curly L is one half uh, dm phi minus one half of m squared phi squared. So naturally, this uh, curly L is the density of the, is Lagrangian density. Since our field is distributed in space, um, the Lagrangian is an integral over some density over, th over the whole space. OK, so, um, well, um, and then we want, from the Lagrangian formalism, we can always pass to the Hamiltonian formalism. Uh, and there we, uh, there is a, some, unpleasant um, uh, feature of that because the Hamiltonian formalism uh, requires us to to, I mean, to separate time from space coordinates. So we need to consider evolution in time. Uh, um, and the time variable is somehow special. Whereas in relativity, we are allowed to do transformations between space and time coordinates. Okay, so the Hamiltonian formalism uh, is not uh, manifestly Lorentz invariant. So at some point, we need to give up uh, um, manifest Lorentz invariants to be able to quantize the field. So we'll fix this uh, in a moment, uh, by the end of this lecture, I suppose. Uh, uh, but. Um, just to proceed along the uh, standard well, textbook uh, procedure, we will need to uh, give up Lorentz covariance for a moment. So uh, then we should write, should separate space and time derivatives. So we write the um, Lagrangian as uh, one half phi dot squared dot denotes time, de time derivative minus one half uh, spatial gradient phi squared. And then the term with mass squared. OK, so this uh, um, three terms have clear physical meaning. So this is uh, the kinetic energy. of the field. It's like q squared, q dot squared term in, uh, in the mechanics of, uh, say, single particle. And uh, these two terms uh, correspond to the potential energy. So the Lagrangian indeed has the, the usual form of kinetic energy minus the potential energy. But here you see that potential energy comes into forms. So there is a energy that uh, grows when the amplitude of the field is big. And uh, this term is big when the gradients, of, spatial gradients of the field are big. So both cost energy. So we cannot make, so if you make the field big, then it will have big energy, or if it has if it varies in space um, uh, rather fast, then it also 
uh, will cost a lot of potential energy. Uh, okay, so um, then how should we view this from the mathematical perspective? Well, we should uh, think of uh, time coordinate, time is time, but then the spatial coordinates, they just label uh, degrees of freedom at each point. So, uh, so this, the spatial coordinates, uh, from that perspective, they're not really coordinates, they're just labels uh, that are similar to an index, say, on the, um, on the canonical variable in classical mechanics. So, uh, well, if you have, um, in classical mechanics, we would have some coordinates, Q, I, F, T, and here we have um, phi of t and x. And uh, in principle, we can write this as phi x of t, writing x as, a, as an index. So from Hamiltonian uh, formalism perspective, this is just a label that enumerates various degrees of freedom. Well, since uh, we are dealing with field theory, this label is continuous and not discrete, but that really doesn't matter. So what that means is that we should take variational derivatives instead of usual derivatives. Uh, apart from that, there are not so much differences. So in particular, I can define a conjugate momentum to the field which is the variational derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to the velocity. Uh, which uh, is simply the velocity of the field. Uh, and then Hamiltonian uh, is given by... Uh, uh, p dot q minus p dot p dot q dot minus the Lagrangian. Uh, so the dot is um, contains summation over all indices in, well, in usual mechanics with finite number degrees of freedom. Here the summation is replaced by integration. Uh, so. Uh, in the Lagrangian, we should replace the velocities by uh, express them in terms of momenta. And then what we get is uh, uh, is the Hamiltonian. And so then we know how to proceed. We just declare that phi and phi are canonically conjugate variables that satisfy the canonical commutation relations. And then we need to diagonalize the Hamiltonian to find the spectrum. In fact, we have already done this because this uh, Hamiltonian has precisely the same form as that for phonons, except that we didn't have this term. And... Um, for phonons, we also had, uh, so this term was multiplied by the speed of sound squared. So here it is multiplied by the speed of light squared, but we set it to one. Uh, okay, and this is just because the, um, in the Clay Gordon operator, d squared is, uh, is just the wave operator. It's d, d times squared minus d space squared. Um, and so what we are doing is we are quantizing the uh, the wave equation, but with an extra term related to the mass of the particles. So the quantization will proceed through the same steps, and it's just the formulas will be absolutely the same. So we actually solved this problem already. Uh, but now the system uh, enjoys an extra symmetry, which is relativistic invariance. 
And so we want to see it uh, in the final answer. Uh, and uh, actually also in some intermediate steps. Uh, and this way of doing things, it's, uh, that is not particularly uh, illuminating in this respect. So in particular, uh, one uh, property that we want to, that is, should be certainly true, is that the Hamiltonian should, should be, the energy should be conserved, right? So the Hamiltonian should not depend on time. Uh, so this is, of course, possible to check. One has to just differentiate, use the Klein Gordon equations, and then, uh, well, the result should be zero. Now, if you do it explicitly, that's not really a simple exercise. It takes a few lines of calculation. Uh, and this is because in uh, uh, here we uh, have broken Lorentz invariant. So this expression is not manifestly Lorentz invariant. And so we need to break it in the Lynn Gordon equation, separate time derivatives from spatial derivatives. It's a bit of a mess, so it's just um, technically uh, technically not very simple. So this is uh, this is really not satisfactory that we cannot immediately check the basic uh, principles like energy conservation uh, uh, just because they are written in a way that's not Lorentz invariant. So our next goal will be to understand how to write conservation of energy in the Lorentz invariant form. And uh, in general, how to write in Lorentz invariant form conservation of anything. So I'll make a sort of side remark on conservation laws. So um, suppose that we have some quantity, uh, some conserved charge uh, that doesn't disappear. Then what does it mean? So suppose we take some finite volume of space. So now I'm uh, again in this uh, three plus one dimensional picture. Well, we don't have, uh, well, we separate space and time. Uh, so we have some volume V uh, that's surrounded by a surface S. Uh, and we want to write down the conservation of some quantity, uh, like, I don't know, that mathematically write down the, uh, describe the fact that the number of people in this room is conserved. Right? So, and can change, of course, because people can come and go outside of the room. So the change, uh, the total number of people in the room is uh, therefore equal to the difference between influx and outflux through the doors, right? So uh, uh, mathematically, we can write that this is uh, uh, an equation that the time variation of uh, the total charge inside this volume that we can write as an integral of the local density of this charge is equal to the influx through the boundary. So we can integrate, we can consider influx through some small patch of the boundary. So locally there is some uh, uh, flux vector j. Uh, and we need to project it into the unit normal to surface S at that point, and this would be the local influx of charge outside of this world. 
So, um, uh, the total influx will be the uh, surface integral. of the local influx, which is a projection of the flux onto the unit normal to the surface. Uh, so now, um, using the uh, Stokes theorem, this, this can be written as, as a volume integral. So by, by the Stokes theorem, the second term is equal to the uh, volume integral of the divergence of the flux. clear that, okay, so this equation was derived without any reference to what this volume was. We could have taken it arbitrary, which means that the only way this to be zero is that the integrand is zero. Uh, so the conservation law then can be written in completely local form. Is an equation First order differential equation that relates the time derivative of density and the with the divergence of the flux. So uh, this is a universal equation. It's conservation of anything can be written this way. Now the question is, if this equation uh, Lorentz invariant or not? Now in a way that we derived it, it uh, wasn't clear because uh, we didn't assume anything about Lorentz invariants. But on the other hand, it better be Lorentz invariant because, uh, okay, it's, uh, it's a general equation and uh, it would be very bad if uh, um, conservation of some quantity would violate Lorentz invariants. So to, to see that this equation doesn't violate Lorentz invariants, um, well, um, um, one can really one can really see that this doesn't happen. That this question actually is Lorentz and Mariton always, uh, and this is because we can um, combine the density and the uh, flux into a single uh, four-dimensional vector. Uh, uh, whereupon the conservation law becomes uh, an equation for the four divergence of this four vector, which should be zero. So uh, whenever we have a conservation law, um, uh, we then are able to construct the current for vector. So this is called the current for vector. And this current for vector will have zero divergence. And vice versa, once we have, so if we have some dynamical system, um, like some sort of field theory, and uh, then we can build a for vector that uh, has zero Divergence, then we have a conservation law. Yes? Uh, for the conservation law, should the uh, new four vector be trying with the minus one? Yeah. Uh, so, but not in this convention, because you see this is upper <coughs> index and this is, yeah, and this is the lower minus. index. So, is it plus minus minus minus? So, so, if you want to recover the conservation law, <coughs> Well, uh, well let, me, let me write this in components. So this will be equal to d0, j0 plus d1 
So the plus here is just because uh, oh, no, the indices uh, the already index. stand in uh, the right position. So if this were, if this were, yeah, we can, right, so we can lower the index on J, and then this will be only <coughs> minus. Um, so anyway, so this is the relativistic invariant form of the conservation laws. But uh, of course, one may wonder who prescribed this to be a, a for vector, because if you write some quantity in this way, uh, we uh, sort of assume that uh, rho and j transform through each other under Lorentz transformations. So that this is not just uh, a way of, uh, uh, so uh, I mean that we assume something more than just rewriting this equation. We assume that Lorentz transformations, when act on the coordinates, they should also act on rho and j in such a way that they mix the, the comp their components in the correct way. So let us check this. So, um, well, what is uh, rho? Um, uh, well, if we um, say take a, a small infinitesimal volume uh, inside the fluid uh, uh, that uh, contains a uh, so that the charge in, in sitting in this volume is delta Q, then rho is just the ratio of delta Q over delta V. Now, um, uh, so how does this transform under Lorentz uh, uh, transformations? Well, it's not immediately clear because if you go into some other reference frame, delta Q shouldn't change. Delta Q is just uh, well, uh, like uh, if uh, delta V is this room and delta Q is the number of people here, someone running very fast will still see the same number of people, right? So delta Q is the same. But delta V uh, actually will change because of the Lorentz contraction. Uh, so to, but here it stands in the denominator, so it's not very easy to understand how rho transforms, uh, what we can do is we can multiply and divide it by delta t. Uh, and we know that uh, the four volume is invariant. Now what is uh, j? Well, uh, j is... Um, uh, again, it's uh, uh, proportional to the density uh, times the velocity, local velocity of the fluid. So local velocity can be understood as the distance delta x. So suppose that this, um, I mean, uh, we are considering some fluid that flows in space in space. And so we just uh, uh, monitor one little volume in this fluid. So if the fluid moves, then this volume will, uh, I mean, it will also move with the fluid. And uh, in time delta t, it will uh, shift by distance delta x. So the velocity, of course, is just delta x divided by delta t. Uh, and uh, then here we immediately see that uh, that uh, there is some invariant quantity 
delta Q divided by the four volume times delta X. And so indeed delta T and delta X transform as a four vector. So rho and J have the right transformation laws. Uh, so uh, rho J therefore transform S delta T delta X. And delta T delta X transforms as, as a vector with upper indices. So our conclusion that we should combine rho and j into a four vector was correct. Okay, so uh, to conclude, uh, the conservation laws can always be written like that. And the next call will be to understand the looking at the field equations or at the action, how can we see what uh, conservation laws will be present in, in the system. So let us make a break for like three minutes. <laughs>